Ooh, it's getting pretty chilly here in New Zealand. So what a better way to spend Sunday afternoon doing a video about ENFP influencers. My name is Lex Morningstar and this YouTube channel is about being INFP. But today specifically, I'll be focusing on ENFPs because they're awesome to sum it up really. The one thing I love about ENFPs the most is their ability to be able to connect with the people around them on such a spiritual and deep level. That is something I so admire about the ENFP. ENFPs are true free spirits and they're so creative and their extroverted intuition allows them to see the fundamentals of life, see the bigger picture and to be inspired by everything around them. I often like to say that ENFPs leap before they feel which is the process of extroverted intuition, their primary function, and then introverted feeling, their auxiliary function. So today I'm going to be talking about four main ENFP influences. And these of course are well-known ENFPs, those who are famous or who were famous. These are people who have impacted the world in one way or another with their personalities really. So without further ado, let's begin. Wrong speed. For those of you who are recovering from a hangover, that's going to sound just right. Let's pull it right back down. Let's try a little faster, see if that picks it up a little bit. Let's get up on 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, Robin Williams. Bless his soul. Man, I just remember when I was a kid watching like Flubber and Jumanji and Mrs. Doubtfire and just, oh, and Aladdin too, because Aladdin was one of my favorites. And I just absolutely adored Robin Williams. The genie was my favorite in Aladdin and the movies which featured Robin Williams were my favorites, like hands down. Robin Williams is such an influential ENFP because he went from being voted the least likely to succeed in his school to being one of the most infamous comedians based on who he is and his improv skills. Robin Williams never faltered to be himself. He would go on to say things such as, you're only given one little spark of madness, you mustn't lose it. And you know, for an INFP, that is something that I completely value and I'm sure a lot of you ENFPs out there value that too. Especially because he's Robin Williams and he's an absolute legend. Robin Williams was born in Chicago in 1951. Robin Williams was often described as a shy kid but really shone in drama class to which then he was described as funny. Surprise, surprise. He discovered his extroversion in high school and then was elected as class president. After graduating high school, Robin Williams enrolled at Claremont Men's College to study political science. He dropped out, however, to pursue his dream of acting. If that is an extroverted intuition, I don't really know what is. In 1973, Robin Williams attained a full scholarship at the Juilliard or Juilliard, I don't know the pronunciation, School of Performing Arts. So Robin Williams attended the Performing Arts School with Christopher Reeve, who would describe Robin Williams as someone who wore tie-dyed shirts with tracksuit bottoms and talked a mile a minute. I'd never seen so much energy contained in one person. He was like a united balloon that had been inflated and immediately released. I watched in awe as he virtually caromed off the walls of the classroom and hallways. To say that he was on would be a major understatement. So he ended up leaving the Performing Arts Centre due to exceeding the expectations of his tutor. So basically he was too good for acting school. So from there he'd start doing stand-up comedy at local clubs. Robin Williams then helped lead the comedy renaissance after the 1960s. He moved to LA to continue with his stand-up comedy and went from club to club and then eventually caught the interest of famous TV producer George Schlatter. And then from there made his debut TV appearance at his comedy show. To which then led Robin Williams to continue his career in television. 
doing stand-up comedy. Robin Williams was known for the mass amounts of awards that he's won, such as the Academy Award and Goodwill Hunting, as well as other classics, such as the ones that I mentioned before, Mrs. Doubtfire. Can I help you, man? Oh, sorry, I'm late. But after all those scotches, I had to piss like a racehorse. Mm. What dreams may come, hook. Mark and Mindy, just to name a very few. So what makes Robin Williams an influential ENFP? Well, it's pretty self-explanatory because, you know, it's Robin Williams, but he was really known for his improvisational skills. He would often come into set and rewrite the script just through improv. The directors would, you know, they'd give him a little bit of leeway because it's Robin Williams and he was pretty epic. He would often keep people on their toes with his very out there personality and that of course is an understatement but Robin Williams was so true to his madness and he really valued that part of people. Unfortunately Robin Williams had an on-off challenge with substance abuse. It was such a huge shock when the world had lost Robin Williams as we remember him for being such a hilarious guy who lit up the world with his comedy. He will always be remembered as one of the greatest stand-up comedians of our time. I don't understand. How come? You're gone, man. I don't understand why half the world is still crying, man. When the other half of the world is still crying too, man. I just can't get it together. See, so maybe you wanted a cat for 365 days. You ain't got it for 365 days. You got it for one day, man. And I tell you, that one day, man, better be your life, man. Because you could say, oh, you could cry about the other 364, but you're going to lose that one day, man. That's all you got, man. Because if you got it today, you don't want it tomorrow, man. Because you don't need it. Because as a matter of fact, as we discovered on the train, tomorrow never happens, man. It's all the same effing day, man. I think I left something out of there. I don't know. It's been such a while since I have attempted the Janis Joplin ball and chain speech because, you know what, I was obsessed with her as a teenager. She was such an influence on me for many different reasons. And the main reason is the sheer fact that she just did not give a... She was just so authentically herself and walked to her own beat. And you know what? As an INFP, that is something like one of the main things that I value in life is walking to your own beat. And she did that. Now, Janis Joplin, she had rose to fame in the 1960s and was known for her very unique bluesy voice. <laughs> powerhouse is somewhat of an understatement. Janis Joplin was also known for her influence in women's liberation in the 1960s. Janis Joplin was born in 1943 in a small Texas town. As a young woman growing up in this small little town, she often felt such a disconnect between herself and the community around her. She felt like she didn't fit in to her high school and would often find herself rebelling against the norms, especially when it came to what was deemed as popular for the average teenage girl. She would do things such as wear men's clothing to rebel against that kind of norm and was known for her loud mouth. She wasn't afraid to speak her truth and to really verbalize her values. Were you not uh, surrounded by friends in high school? They laughed me out of class, out of town, and out of the state. Mm. So I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> Janice really enjoyed being able to explore her sexuality and would often have a lot of rumors spread about her at high school. Janice discovered her love of music from a very young age and had joined the church choir. She had discovered such a love of blues and jazz as she was going through her teen years and was inspired by blues vocalists such as Odetta and Bessie Smith. 
After high school, she had attended the University of Texas, where she had discovered her love of drinking and socializing rather than studying. Which really, you know, that is a classic case of extroverted intuition, but also a weak introverted sensing. And, you know, she isn't the first to do that, as we can see amongst all of these influential ENFPs. What you're about to find out is that they all had these periods of where they kind of I wouldn't call it slacked a little bit, but wanted to explore different options really and to really enjoy life. And I think that's what Janice was doing. So instead of concentrating on her studies, she would attend open mic nights where she would absolutely blow the socks off her audience. Again, a very classic extroverted intuition moment where she had taken all of these opportunities to be able to express herself. Janice would also during these college years, experiment with her bisexuality. And this was also a way for her to be able to stick it to the man and really um, help to develop that woman's liberation. So in 1963, Janice had left university to develop her music career. And at first she didn't gain much traction. She auditioned for the psychedelic rock band Big Brother and The Holding Company. The band quickly became famous with Janice on board and she moved from her background role to more of a frontman role. Hits such as Ball and Chain and Summertime were charting. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm just reminiscing as I'm talking about this because I just could not get enough of those songs when I was a teenager. Extroverted intuition again took over when Janice Joplin decided to leave the group because she felt like the band was holding her back. She took off as a solo artist and had collaborated with the famous band, the Cosmic Blues Band, and played at historical events such as Woodstock. Janice was known for her long struggle with substance abuse and would use things like alcohol and heroin to be able to cope with the struggles in her life. On October the 4th, 1970, Janice had overdosed on heroin, which had led to her accidental death. But of course, her influence continues on in our modern world through her will to be herself and to continue to push those limits of society and to really rebel against a broken system. Janice would have never let these mundane rules confine and restrict her and would always find a way to break out of them with such sheer talent and creativity. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. This one has a little star. This one has a little car. Say, what a lot of fish there are. Yes, some are black and some are blue, some are old and some are new, some are sad and some are glad and some are very, very bad. Why are they all sad, bad, glad? I do not know. Go and ask your dad. So, of course, my next ENFP is Dr. Seuss and for very good reason. Now we all grew up with Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss helped us to read. Dr. Seuss helped us with our vocabulary. Born in 1904, Dr. Seuss was a legendary child's author. He helped children to develop their vocabulary through his unconventional and very unique use of words, descriptions, and cartoons. He was also known for his political illustrations, especially during and after the war. So Dr. Seuss was officially known as Theodore Gazelle and was born and raised in Springfield, Massachusetts. Duh. Massachusetts. I need to start reading Dr. Seuss again, I think. So he attended Dartmouth College and eventually became the editor-in-chief of the Humor magazine. However, like Janis Joplin, Dr. Seuss was caught being a little bit naughty by drinking with his fraternity, which of course was against the law at the time. Dr. Seuss was then encouraged to resign from his position as editor-in-chief. Dr. Seuss, who was known then as Theodore, had changed his name from Theodore to his pseudonym, Dr. Seuss, and then went back to create more content for Humor Magazine. Done and dusted. Well done. <laughs> he graduated from Dartmouth and then decided to 
attend Oxford University to pursue his PhD in literature. At Oxford, he had met his wife, Helen Palmer, who had encouraged him to drop out of his studies to pursue his real ambition of becoming a cartoonist. In 1927, Dr. Susan Helen had moved back to the US where he then decided to submit his cartoons to different oh, to different book publishers and magazines. Over this period, he had gained himself quite a reputation of being such an excellent illustrator and writer where he had gained the interest of a wide variety of different advertisers and comedians. He featured on many campaigns such as Flit and had went on to join political cartoons in the World War II era. After the war, he had continued with his love of writing children's books to which we see the infamous Cat in a Hat and Green Eggs and Ham and of course much more like How the Grinch Stole Christmas that classic. In 1954, Life magazine had reported on the issue of children's literature. Apparently, children were having a lot of trouble being able to learn how to read and write. And this is where Dr. Seuss stepped in and saved the day. Because of Dr. Seuss's unconventional style, Dr. Seuss had helped many children develop their vocabulary and thus today he is remembered for being such a legendary child's author and cartoonist. As someone with such a life-changing talent, Dr. Seuss didn't do what society expected of him. He had changed the lives of many children and today continues to be such an icon for children to learn how to read and how to develop vocabulary. Now last but certainly not least, a young woman who had helped change the course of our modern day life today, Anne Frank. Anne Frank, who was Jewish, was known for journaling her experiences as a teenager in hiding during the mass genocide of Jewish people, also known as the Holocaust. And this journal had gone on to be published known as the Diary of Anne Frank. Which of course most of you probably know of because if you're like me you probably studied it at high school during English class. <laughs> during the political takeover from the Nazis, four-year-old Annalise Marie and her family had fled to Amsterdam in seek of refuge from certain prosecution. On her 13th birthday, she had received a diary. Her first journal entry was written to her imaginary friend named Kitty, which had read, I hope I will be able to confide everything to you as I have never been able to confide in anyone, and I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support. Now that, my friends, is a classic extroverted intuition moment. She had found an opportunity to be able to create something out of nothing, really, in a moment of confinement. And now over the two years of hiding, Anne had documented absolutely everything she experienced during her time of refuge here in Amsterdam. Now of course during this period the Nazis had begun to take over where of course they had things such as curfews for Jewish people, they weren't allowed to attend school, they weren't allowed to take public transport, they weren't allowed to purchase things at most shops and many, many, many of them were forced into concentration camps. So as you can imagine, Anne's experiences were very grim, to put it lightly. Her last diary entry was in August 1944, around the period where the Frank family were unfortunately discovered and forced into concentration camps. Anne and her sister Marie were sent to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Germany. Unfortunately, in 1945, both Anne and her sister had passed away with speculation of typhus. Anne's father, Otto, had fortunately survived the genocide and had ended up being reunited with Anne's diary, which had been saved from their place of refuge along with other various 
bits of paperwork. Otto was astounded at what he had discovered in Anne's diary and had felt such a push to get this journal discovered by the entire world. In 1947, Otto had the journal published as Anne Frank, the diary of a young girl. And today, this diary remains one of the most widely read books, with 60 languages being published. Over 30 million copies had been distributed. I wouldn't have a clue what being part of a mass genocide is like and being so oppressed and ostracized, but to have someone like Anne, a young woman who had the courage to write about all of her experiences and words that were beyond her years shows such a strong ENFP. Anne was known for her lively personality. Her extroverted intuition allowed her to capitalize on every new experience she had, even if that was absolutely terrifying. Again, I could not imagine what that would have been like for her, but she had used those experiences to document and to be able to translate through her own creativity and her amazing use of language. And today, the diary of Anne Frank remains such a widely used historical tool. Now that wraps up my choice of influential ENFPs, but I would really love to hear about yours. So if you have a favorite ENFP, list it down in the comments. I really hope you enjoyed this video. But for now, I hope you have a really good day, night, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world, and I will see you all again next time. Bye. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches, I must make amends. Worked hard all my lifetime, no help from my friends. So oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz?